Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining Paris Art Museum Miami virtually. Uh, my name is Rene Morales, and I am the Director of Curatorial Affairs and Chief Curator. I want to welcome you all to the first installment of a series of programs that we'll be rolling out over the course of the next few months, in which PAM curators engage in candid, intimate discussions with some of the most dynamic practitioners active within Miami, the Miami's art community. The series is presented with the generous support of the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce Giovanna Gonzalez and Naja Moon, who will be in conversation with Jennifer Ignacio to debut the fourth episode of their project titled Aesthetics of Mobility and discuss their individual practices. Before I introduce Giovanna and Naja, I would like to give props to the incredible PAM team that makes these live studio visits and so much more uh, come alive at the museum. Thank you to our curatorial staff, Maria Elena Ortiz, Jennifer Ignacio, Maritza Lacayo, and Iberia Perez for your work in organizing this series, with a special thanks to Jen, as well as our Director of Adult Programs, Anita Brand, for organizing the logistics behind these events. And as always, thank you to our amazing AV team, Denise Faxis and Andrew Bird. Now, before I dive in, I want to mention the upcoming studio visits so you can mark your calendar. So just you know, grab, a, grab a pencil. Uh, next month on October 8th, we will have Morel Doucet in conversation with PAM curator Maria Elena Ortiz. Then on November 12th, I'll be doing a talk with Reginald O'Neill. And on December 10th, we have Carlos Esteves with curatorial assistant and publications coordinator Maritza Lacayo. Uh, the series will continue next year. so. Stay tuned for further info on that. Uh, my deepest gratitude goes out to every artist who has accepted the invitation to participate in this series. Giovanna Gonzalez was born and raised in Los Angeles, where she received a BFA at Otis College of Art and Design. Her work seeks to connect private and public space through interventionist participatory art with an emphasis on collaboration and collectivity. Through installations designed for non-directive play, Giovanna addresses the shifting notions of gender and identity, intimacy, and proximity. She is founder and curator of Supplement Projects, an alternative art space and community meeting, meeting point based here in Miami. Co-founder of performative reading club, Read What You Want, and a member of queer feminist arts collective, Coven Berlin working on exhibitions and events that focus on body politics, gender, labor, sexuality, and art. Naja Moon is a Miami-based artist and cultural producer. Born and raised in Durham, North Carolina, she received a BA in communication studies and another BA in studio art from Pfeiffer University in 2009. Her practice is an amalgamation of practicalities by which to improve one's life, engaging design and language cultural responsibility and community. She uses drawing and text to explore the intersections of queer identity, the body and movement, black culture, and familiar relations, both personal and communal. So I hope you'll enjoy tonight's conversation and I hope you will consider supporting this and many other programs presented by the museum by going to pam.org forward slash donate. Now, without further delay, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Giovanna Gonzalez, Naja Moon, and Jennifer Ignacio. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. Um, and thank you, Giovanna and Naja, for uh, accepting this invitation and joining us here tonight to talk about your work. Um, before we dive in, I just want to uh, let everyone know that if you have any questions along uh, this conversation and during this conversation, just uh, shoot any questions in the Q&A that you see right at the bottom of the screen. And uh, I'll be reading those after we're done, okay? So um, again, back to the artists. Uh, thank you so much. I'm really excited tonight because besides having this uh, amazing conversation and uh, diving deep into their um, practice, uh, we're also premiering the fourth episode of Aesthetics of Mobility. So <laughs> we have two premieres tonight, this series, the Studio Live um, Conversations, and uh, this 
amazing project, which I want to hear more about. Um, uh, if you can talk how it all started. Um, I think to me, you know, just giving a quick uh, intro to this, uh, seeing this work, um, especially in these times, right, where everything is, is digital and online, it really trans or brings us to this more personal space, which is your your living space. So um, I always have fun watching these. And if, uh, you know, anyone that's in here tonight hasn't seen the previous episodes, I highly recommend it. So go back to episode one and watch the whole uh, the wow. whole series up to now. So. Oh, what a plug right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that um, kind of comparing this to other people doing similar similar things in the van conversion space, you see really detailed documentation of the process. And we didn't do that. We failed at that issue. <laughs> <laughs> so having the time over the past couple of months, we wanted to archive our process in a different way. And so kind of dissected the different design, design decisions and um, just like the cultural influences that made us decide to do what we decided. Um, and this is our way of archiving the process kind of in reverse. Yeah, so like each episode kind of more or less gives a glimpse into different sections of the house. So just kind of approaching this idea of the layout and what it means and kind of diving deeper in terms of um, just the spectrum of how far we can kind of, I guess, dissect what each of these sections can be. Uh, allows us to do that within each of the episodes. So instead of revealing, I guess, the whole entire truck all at once, we kind of are doing little snippets here and there. Yeah, and what I like about it is, like you said, you're not documenting the process. I mean, in a way, you are documenting this process, but more like the the philosophical, right, exactly. the psychological process of going through these phases of your construction. It's not the material and the physical process. Right. Of, of getting the, the space already. But um, yeah, talk to me a little bit about how you, how you um, yeah, decide about these. I, I know the first one, as we can see here, is the intro. So it's really introducing us to this um, idea of, of why, uh, why you're doing this uh, project. But then uh, you go into the bed and then cooking, uh, which is more of this action, right, that is taken within the space. And um, yeah, so talk a little bit about how you, um, uh, I guess, yeah, how you decide what, what to what to dive deep into. I think, <laughs> I think for the first episode, I mean, obviously, the, the first um, intro to anything is always like we're we're in it as well where we're just we're also figuring it out to a certain capacity but i think it's um coming to the conclusion of you know like in in february we had our like quote unquote housewarming if you will um and then immediately after that we kind of this whole lockdown situation happened and so just kind of within that period of like finishing to a certain 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 extent like where we were at and living into the space. I think the intro was a way for us to like stop and reflect really as to like what we've accomplished and what it means. And so it was kind of grounding the series more or less, I think for us, like gave us a moment to really stop and think about what is it that we're actually doing, even though it's always been in the back of our head, but I guess more or less, yeah, document it. Yeah, I think for, for me, I don't read as often as I wish I did. And so this series kind of gave us, gave me starting points for research. And so when we talked about the bed, I, we reflected a lot on the work that Black Power Naps um, does. Right. Um, and when we, and just overall thinking about aesthetics of mobility, we were reading Dark Space and just thinking about architecture from a different perspective. Um, and then thinking about the kitchen episode, I think that some of the similarities in our practice is that everything is collaborative to some extent. And so in this episode, we found ways to bring in our family, call them on the phone, interview them about recipes. And even though this is our intimate space, we know that we're, it's a collaboration with our community, the way that we move through the space. Uh -huh. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I think uh, what you talk about, I, think, I believe in the intro video is um, this idea of freedom, right? Like, how did you decide to to build this living space within this moving um, structure? Uh, and, and how is it now? I think mobility is very, um, it's a current topic, right? Like, I think working remotely, I see a lot of people, I, ha I have actual friends that, you know, are, are working um, abroad, uh, but they're still, you know, because of the, uh, this idea of working remotely allows this freedom to move around. So um, obviously you had this idea before this whole pandemic, but how current is it now? Yeah. Uh, and how does it relate to your, uh, to how you deal with this current situation? Or is it not different at all to how you've, you know, uh, lived through, through? Right. No, I mean, I think that, um, like you said, this was a decision that we made and had been working on since um, 2018. Uh, so it wasn't, the decision wasn't connected to this current moment. But as things started happening, we realized that this is kind of saving us. Yeah, it's totally saving us. In some <laughs> way, it was like a blessing and just being like, we're ahead of the game in a lot of, in a lot of ways. And uh, partially like what we even talk about in ep episode four is thinking about this idea of autonomy and I think the fact that we do have this ability of being mobile um, and living in this space and having this sort of freedom is allowing us to really just have space to think creatively and do the things that we want to be able to do which I mean as we all know like there's more than a handful of friends and family and friends of friends that are have to move out of their places like lost jobs all of this and so i think in to a certain degree we really like i don't want to say like we somehow were like in preparation <laughs> you know i mean it really it, if if anything felt really blessed to have this um especially like right now yeah great well let's let's get deep into episode four i'm excited to to share this with the audience um, we're, we're going to go offline now, off camera, I mean, and, uh, we'll enjoy the video. Now we're back with episode four. Yep. And talking about just the time that we've invested in how much time it's taken for sort of like the learning process into making our home. Yeah. What are we talking about? Practice, man. What are we talking about? Practice? Talking about time. Talking about time. We're talking about practice, man. <laughs> We're talking about practice. We're talking about practice. 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 We ain't talking about the game. We're talking about practice. December 2018, when I drove off of a shady Hialeah lot with this thing, right? <laughs> so legit coming on two years. Yep. And thinking about all the work that we've done, all the work that other people have done, helping right. us, showing up, you know, on different days. Oh shit. Oh, oh let me not. <laughs> Michelle is building. <laughs> Seems more Michelle. accurate, I think. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And just being like, there's all these little reminders of different times and different things that have happened in the process of this project. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's it's definitely been a labor of love. I feel pretty blessed and lucky that we have a community of people that are so supportive behind this project happening. It being functional and up and running. And I feel like we still have a cohort of people that we can always just know that they can come through, you know, in For one sure. way or another, and it goes both ways. And and I think there's also areas in which there's sometimes like you know we were we we're learning from others, 
and vice versa. Yeah. You know? So I think there's been like a really beautiful exchange in that way. Totally. How long it has taken to get to this point has a lot to do, well, I want to say a lot, but partially to do with the fact that we've been self-funding this, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, there's like moments where we have to take breaks, you know what I mean? If I can't practice, I can't practice, man. I'm hurt, I'm hurt. I mean, simple as that. And even kind of using this project as as a mile marker, to think about all the, the shifts in our personal lives that have happened through, like over the course of this project. Right. You know, there was there was the first period where I tried to do a bunch of stuff by myself and I didn't know what I was doing. And it looked really crappy in here. Right. And I, the first time that I lived in here was over the summer and you were in Berlin. Right. Right. So I have these kind of reminders of moments in time that mirror moments in the process of this project. Yeah, hundred percent. As funny as it may sound to think about that, like the house was made one way at first and then shifted and completely gutted it out and started over actually helped in a lot of ways. It was important for you to go through that process. Also for us to have a better understanding about like, what are the most important functional things that we need? Again, having an opportunity to stay, stay at Misa's house, you know, have that period of time to really kind of revamp everything that we wanted to yeah. happen and continually working on that. While simultaneously, you know, we have to still juggle all the other work that we're doing. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I think it's also in terms of time, it's not only just the time that we're investing into it, but it's like because of the time that we spent inside of here, we're able to really have a better understanding of what works and what doesn't work. But then I think new ideas arise in terms of, oh, like it would be dope if we do this. You know, you can watch as many tutorials as you want, you can plan as much as you want, but there, I feel like, at least for myself, there's nothing really like just doing it, just right. doing the thing, like actually screwing up and then doing it again. Or being willing to take that chance, if you will, to fuck up, you know? Yeah. It's like, I think why we're calling it time slash practice, because time can just pass, but practice, I think for us in relationship to this is about really being present on what it's like to live here and doing it on the daily to the extent that it starts to impact how how we make things later how you adjust that shot you know mm -hmm. to go back to the alan iverson because we're definitely going to be sampling that in this video <laughs> but it's like practice you're talking about you know yeah yeah we're talking about practice because because if you don't it is. yeah if you don't keep putting that jump shot up you don't know how to adjust it when a defender comes from a different right. direction. And I think that that's what what we're learning in here. Yeah. It's like, actually- and If you don't sweat for this whole entire thing. Mm -hmm. You can probably see the sweat <laughs> on our face, but next episode we will have some form of a better fan yeah. unit situation. Yeah. Maybe even at AC. I yeah. don't know. But it has become more important <laughs> yeah. because we've been practicing living in here. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. Not that it wasn't said before, but. Oh, with the jabs, <laughs> with the jabs. <laughs> but you know, sometimes you just gotta go through the motions, you know what I mean? Whatever. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> I mean, as we were preparing to talk about this, I think one of the things that kept coming up for me, as, as an artist, I traditionally haven't been making three-dimensional things. Mm -hmm. And working on this, I feel so comfortable in a wood shop now. And so while people might might not look at this project as a traditional art project, right. I have through that process, through the time investment, through practice, I've learned how to work with different materials and different and gain skill sets that are gonna impact how I make work later. Yeah, yeah I mean in, in terms of even whether or not other people view this as an art practice or not. I mean, I personally think it is. I mean, I feel like for artists, like what is the difference between my quote unquote day-to-day -day life activities and my 
our practice. All of those things are intertwined and influence each other and inevitably, um, you know, it's coming from the same person, yeah. the same two people, you know, and everything here is treated in that same manner and thought process of thinking creatively and what it can be and what it means, you know, and so I think that in terms of in investing even the time and sort of thinking about what materials we want to use, like what is the feeling that we want into the space? Like not having windows, but having skylights, yeah. you know? Like deciding what kind of skylights we were going to get and how much that really did determine what the space felt like. It's a constant sort of evolving kind of evolution that's happening here. The ebb and flow, the people that are coming in, the sort of activities that we have here, everything from having people over for drinks and like a dance party to exhibition, our just day to day activities is embedded now into the history, the archive of the space, right? And yeah. I think that that is what what actually makes the space a, a functional work of art. We're talking about time and the fact is, is that time is perpetual. It's not stagnant. And it's the same thing with this space. When you're talking about it shifting for different purposes, but also just naturally shifting based on how we're, what we've learned through the practice of living here. You know, like making additions, changing things. And I mean, I think it's the same for any home, right? You know, your, your parents live in a place for 20 years and they're like we should renovate the kitchen this is outdated or this isn't working anymore there's something better available now and because of how compact this space is that we're having that kind of thought process every day about like actually maybe we should hang that there or what if we did it like this we're, we're just thinking about it constantly and so time is moving fast and slow all at once it's easy to get disheartened in some way, knowing that there's some people that are like, I built my, I built my tiny house in three months. <laughs> How much money did you spend on that though? What did you really do to get to that point? Right. You know? And so being okay with the process, being okay with, yeah. you know, the longevity of it, like that it's, that it is a slow moving in some way. But I think that's also the, not the prompt, like the expectation of the finished product is that by having this thing completed in the future, you're, we're gonna be less likely to have to juggle so many things because we've accomplished this thing that's gonna alleviate the need to do. I really feel like we've been able to gain even more autonomy. And a lot of that has to do with the fact, okay, we're putting in all this work now, but there's certain things that we don't have to worry about anymore. We don't have to base our decisions because of basically debt, if you wanna say it. And that's a level of freedom that also allows you to think creatively and allows you to be able to do the things that you're really passionate about doing. Knowing that that's also there, if you want to say it, like the end, yeah. like it's motivating enough. Totally. I mean, I think that's why one of the reasons why aesthetics of mobility as a title is so accurate to me is that, you know, what does it look like to live a mobile lifestyle is how that's what that says and also it doesn't look like a visual thing right it might it looks like freedom it looks like autonomy yeah it looks like home is wherever you are it look you know the, the things that we desire and kind of taking that by the reins i don't know whatever right. the metaphor is and being in control of it swamp inside of the house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love it. 
I hope other people laughed at us as much as we laughed at us. <laughs> no, I do. I think there's always, in, in each episode, there's always, you know, something that really catches me. Um, and that's something, you know, every time I'm watching, like, a series on Netflix or whatever, um, and I really fall in love with it, the first thing I see is, are there more episodes? Like, how many seasons are there? And I think that's the first question. Are you planning on more? And can we, you know, hopefully, uh, we're, we're going to have a lot more episodes after this one. Yeah, definitely. I think I think the episodes will for sure continue. Um, the conversations are something that is like, it's, it's a constant thing for us. And so, and we're happy to continue the series. I mean, yeah, we'll also, we will field comments from, uh, oh, when my mom is in here. What's up, OG? Sorry. Uh, <laughs> but we'll also field suggestions for different segments of the space to kind of explore. Um, I do see one question here. I was going to leave the questions towards the end, but uh, this is more related to this work before we go into the, the other works. Um, is where are you parked right now? So where do you where do you stay? This is a a moving you know a house on wheels. Um, and where are you right now? And have you have you been able to to travel like away from Miami with it, or or not really? I mean, so in terms of where we're at right now, we really like to keep um, where we're posted very discreet, so not shareable information. But uh, <laughs> no, we have not made it out of Miami yet, but we plan on doing so very, very soon. So as you can see in part of this episode, we're working on the engine and kind of getting that stuff geared up so that we can do long haul trips um, and feel really safe and secure as well as being self-sufficient in terms of understanding the mechanics of our home. And so that's a huge part for us um, before we do some sort of long haul trip, but that's definitely in the making. Um, all right, so I feel, you know, this, um, it's, it's interesting because we had another question you kind of answered within the video too, is how does this process inform your art? And how do you see this as living art? But I think one of the reasons that you know if you decided to start off with with aesthetics of mobility and that i brought up to previous conversations with had is that you know not just this episode you're thinking your community and and it really highlights how uh you know it's a group effort um and i see that a lot in in other projects that you both have done so um I would like to dive uh, into um, some of your individual practices and we'll start off with Giovanna now. Um, so let's look at the first slide uh, where we see um, some pictures here of this project that you did called uh, Supplement Project. So Giovanna, I would love to, for the audience to hear a little bit more about this work and, and you know, you. And hopefully they'll see these connections, right, uh, with aesthetics of mobility, um, this, this building of a community and, and sharing spaces. Yeah, so I started Supplement Projects last year, and the way that I came about it was more or less when I moved here a few years ago, just sort of seeing or feeling like for myself that there was a lack of artist fan spaces um, and it was something that I wanted more of as well as I think uh, the community of people that I'm with also want more of and so I just kind of had this idea to go ahead and start something why not in my space so like utilizing both the living room and other areas of the house and also the backyard to not only put together exhibitions um, but to put together programmings and talks and meetings and on the image to the right where it says rest stops is the first actual activation that happened for supplement projects which um was really just a meeting of people coming together and i offered them coffee coffee and tea and we just sat in my backyard um and i worked together with a variety of people here in miami uh to kind of like host a different day each day um that actually happened during basel that year and as of right now, Supplement Projects is now thinking about being more of a nomadic project um, and partially being inside of 
our home, mine and Nadra's home. Mm -hmm. Great, and um, I think we have another work here to see like previous work on the next slide um, that also embodies, I think, this the sense of you know community and groupings coming together, but also um, this building of um, not intimate space, but using this intimate space to to foster relationships. So, uh, if you can talk a little bit about what this scope and the influences for this work too, and I believe there were um, more than one act, maybe three, if if I'm not. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, great. Um, what what are the differences between Act One, Two, and Three? So the acts are still happening. Um, essentially, for this piece, uh, I was thinking about this idea of um, the sort of like notion of public and private space and how those things overlap a lot of the times, and trying to understand like who those spaces are meant for and what it means to create space for ourselves, right? So like for our community and for this piece in particular, I was inspired by this French Victorian design that's called a tête-à-tête, -tête, just uh, two chairs that are facing opposite to each other. And traditionally we're kind of known for being a place where you meet lovers in a discreet manner, more or less. And so taking that in sort of a contemporary version, thinking about what it means for queer people of color to meet in public space and how I can create a structure that is actually thinking about ideas of intimacy that is both public and private. Um, and a part of that being that the piece itself is modular. And so those are all individual separate components that make up a larger whole. And so within using the, the modularity of the piece, um, thinking about the different orientations of the self. So like the, the fact that I am one individual doesn't mean that I'm just one singular thing, but I can be many things all at once. So it's, you know, what you perceive isn't always what it is, is kind of the dialogue that I'm trying to have. And so with each time that I get invited to show this piece, I show a different orientation and I have a different program that is accompanied with that. So, you know, the, the narrative and the sort of archive that follows along with it is embedded within the structure. And that's the way that I kind of view those two things being equally hand in hand um, both the program and involving the community, plus the sort of structure itself. Um, so yeah, for this first act, it was at the Bass Museum, which they actually commissioned me to do this project. Um, and I had worked with uh, Fem Power as well as This Girl's Lunchbox, which are This Girl's Lunchbox and Naja also co-founded, are two uh, you know queer fem uh, communities here in Miami, and I felt that it was a perfect opportunity for all of us to collaborate and have this sort of dialogue. That's amazing. Um, what's the, uh, I think, you know, the, uh, the question here is, uh, thinking of, of this program as a studio, right, a studio visit, I'm interested, now we look at previous works and then we looked at most recent, you know, this collaborative with aesthetics and mobility and collaboration, I mean, and then um, now, like, what are you working on? I know you have a couple of projects upcoming uh, at Locus. If you can talk a little bit about that, but um, yeah, what? How have you been working now? Uh, you know, in this uh, social distancing world, um, w what is w what projects are you working on now? Um, I would say that the majority of this moment of being in this like pandemic um, and this idea of social distancing, I've been using a lot of time to just reflect and ground myself and find places in which I can find joy and peace. And so a lot of that has been invested into um, rest and reading and researching and kind of regrouping with individuals in my community. Um, and so that doesn't necessarily reflect something that's like visual um, per se or tangible, but more um, what I feel is important in order to like move forward. And I think, you know, it's important for us to be okay with not producing all of the time. Um, and so I, I really made that an intention. I felt that was the appropriate thing for me to be doing for the last few months, more or less. But uh, yeah, I mean, I have this show at Locust Projects that will be opening up um, early next year. 
and was actually supposed to open up in April, but due to COVID, it's been postponed. Um, and it's also a sort of like structural piece, which then will also come be a company with the sort of programming that is collaborative, um, as well as involving the community. And, and yeah. is this you uh, on the slide now working on that project or just really yeah. building up material? Yeah, and, and where I worked uh, on this project where I kind of like fabricated and worked with the team of people was um, at this space that's called Pulp Arts, which is in Gainesville, Florida. So yeah, it's a it's a structural piece that also has some elements of modularity that I it's also made out of steel and and welded together. Yeah, and I think you know um, you mentioned this this uh, moment of just toning down and reading and research, which is so essential, I think, to an artist uh, practice. And you even talk about it. I think you know this time and practice. I almost feel uh, practice is. Uh, almost like this physical, uh, uh, making time physical, right? Uh, because you can only produce this work and, and practice and, uh, and create these, um, these processes with time, but then uh, time is just so, you know, fleeting. I think you can, you, you only see the um, time becoming physical through practice so i don't know it's just yeah. my mind going in loop oh, yeah i mean i think that was the that was the point of including the clip of alan iverson saying if i can't practice i can't practice if i'm hurt i'm hurt yeah and right I now a lot of people are hurting and you know you just need to take a break for sure you know yeah that's such an important part and for everyone you know not just in artistic practices i think everything you do um exactly. And yeah, so let's hear a little bit more about you, Naja. I think this um, sense of this idea of collaboration is is very uh, it's a big part within your work as well. Um, yeah. We can look at the other slide, which is one of these projects that you've done, um, Black Family, as well as how to put to, how to fix how to patch the black leaky roof. <laughs> I don't have the slide here, so um, uh, so yeah, talk to us a little bit more how these projects came to life and uh, how it informs, you know, uh, your thought process. Yeah, I think um, one of the things that, that I learned by being around a lot of dream defenders is uh, the different kind of segments of activism. And the thing that I'm drawn to the most is the part where we're building the art alternative. Um, and it's necessary to, to fight and there's things that need to change, but we also need to be prepared for how we want to live after that. And I think that Black Family was born out of that, was how can we congregate in a space around um, food and aromas and music that make us feel nostalgia, that make us feel safe, um, and really just be our, our truest selves. Um, how can we create environments that make people want to work together. Um, and so that's what Black Family has always been about for me, was just thinking about the, the alternative in the present. And then the next project too, I think you, uh, particularly interesting because um, I think with Black Family, you're bringing people together, right? But here you're almost doing the opposite of, of going into these communities. If you were moving and, and reaching out to um, to this neighborhood or to people within this neighborhood in Little Haiti. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, yes. Um, but also I lived there. Um, I lived on 56th Street for two years and then I lived, Michelle and I, who collaborated on this project, we lived on 59th Street for about a year. And uh, I'm so grateful that she, she basically let me stay in her home for several months as I was saving money to buy this truck to start this project. Um, and so that's just another example of how community has functioned in my life. Uh, but we, this was sparked because we were sitting outside and watching design district umbrellas walk around in little Haiti and just thinking about the irony of that. 
and wanting to make something that could replace that, that could act as um, a flag to kind of delineate this space, um, but also be a utilitarian object. So it's a design thing, but it's also how can we give something to people that functions for them? Uh -huh. And I love, I have a, a personal moment with this because I lived on 62nd Street and um, it wasn't that long, I mean, it, I always think it wasn't that long ago, for, you know, from, from March when this all happened, but I think I moved from there in July, but it might have been either February or March that I, I saw someone walking with this umbrella and wow. It reminded me, you know, of course, I already knew about the project. It was so nice to see, you know, this uh, being put to use and, and yeah. walking around with, with this umbrella. That's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. It was also exciting to for me to learn a little bit of Creole in this process mm -hmm. and think about um, poetry and language and what that means about preserving a space and how important that is to the culture of, a, of an area. Um, and so oh, Miami commissioned this project and we were really intentional about including poetry and language into it as well. Mm -hmm. And um, what are you working on now? Um, if you just, yeah, let's, let's dive deep into this work here. If you can, um, and I think besides these uh, projects that you do, uh, social projects with the community and with the group and collaboration, uh, you also have these beautiful drawings, and this is, uh, I think, one example of it. There are many more, uh, but let's talk about this. I think this is something that you're working on now with sound and drawing. I, I think um, in the beginning of showing my drawings, there was a lot of uh, translation into poetry, and I have started thinking about how these marks could also be directions for movement or for sound as well. And so I'm starting a project called The Huddle is a Prayer Circle, where I'm trying to compose works that are translations of my drawings. So I've come up with this kind of um, interpretive music staff that I just sketch on top of, and then I take it to digital music software and I draw the, the marks on different instruments to produce sound. Um, and then I also have started going through the process of adding lyrics and reaching out to my mother, who's the incredible singer. And there's another interpretive element where she's taking that text and performing it in ways that I never would have imagined. So it's been a really beautiful opportunity to kind of expand on what I've been doing, but also collaborate with my mother. Oh, amazing. Yeah, and I did, um, if you haven't, for the audience haven't signed up into Naja's uh, mailing list. I just received an email today where uh, you sent these, like you mentioned, like you described, almost like this pen pal letter describing these different moments in, the, in your life. And you had a, a short story and I, I would love to, you said more soon, but if you can't share anything now, it's fine. But um, from the from this email, there is this brief uh, preview into this conversation or this journey that you did to have with your mom. <laughs> Hopefully, this uh, more, yeah more collaboration from that, and I'd love to hear more about that. If you can share, if not, we can just listen to the sound here. I mean, listen, my mom is in the chat right now. Okay, <laughs> so I'm gonna put her on blast. Okay, she called me at four o'clock in the afternoon and said she was on her way to Cocoa Beach, which is gonna take her 10 hours at least. So I was like, you want me to meet you there in the middle of the night? And she was like, if you can. <laughs> so, so we did. And um, it, was, it was really beautiful. And I, this, this time period being so difficult for so many reasons. I mean, last night I could barely go to sleep because I'm thinking about Brianna Taylor. And I'm like, how is this possible? Yeah that this person was killed in their bed and nobody's being held accountable. Um, so I'm, I'm living for moments where I get to spend time with my family, um, get to enjoy food with my partner, uh, whatever the thing may be. But I really do feel like connecting with my mom has always been a trigger for better things for me. Uh -huh. nice. I don't know if I answered your question or no, it went does. on a tangent. <laughs> 
yeah um let's listen to the sound component of this uh of this music. Mm -hmm. So this um, this is exactly what you're describing, going into the software, putting notes, and this is the final result. Yeah. Thanks. What about, um, I think right after this, we have these drawings as well. Uh, I mean, these uh, photographs, right? Both. Yeah, <laughs> I guess so, yeah. They're, um, they're long exposure photographs um, and kind of in the same, um, vein as the as the, the I guess pen on paper um, but in this case I'm playing old gospel songs that just get me super hype and I really enjoy listening to a lot of Kirk Franklin Richard Smallwood and uh, my mother conducted the choir in the church that I went to when I was really young so in this way I feel like I'm kind of performing what I saw her do as a child and so I'm dancing to the music and I'm conducting the choir, so to speak. And, and what comes from those photographs are these drawings that I think mimic the aesthetic of what I do on paper. Mm -hmm. Okay, take a look at the next one. That's good, because it really answers the question I was going to have, what was your relationship with music? But um, you kind of just answered that. Okay. And I think, um, just to wrap this up, because I think we're almost running out of time, I would uh, love to go back into this other project that you have. Um, I think also work collaboratively and most recently too um, at, at Fountainhead. Um, so tell me more about this. Uh, again, here we see this, uh, I'll let you talk, but this idea of community of of course, a table and food, and, and I love that, this this continuous overlap uh, within your projects. Yeah, so in the month of June, uh, Naja, myself, and Misa, Misael Soto um, stayed at the Fountainhead House, and during that time, sort of established this project, which is kind of part of a larger whole and a continual research, but thinking about reimagining what a better Miami artist community can look like. Um, and in order for us to kind of have those conversations, we hosted these really small, intimate dinners, uh, like five people at a time uh, to kind of still maintain social distancing and just thinking about ways of being intentional of how to still come together and be safe. Um, but more or less like thinking how we really felt we were continually having these conversations uh, specifically even now as things are coming to the surface how important it is that it is for us to collectivize as a community um, and what it means for us to constantly be in dialogue with each other and reimagine these sort of hierarchies these structures that are put into place and how maybe we can have a better equal relationship within uh institutions organizations etc but also a better kind of grounding sort of community within ourselves right so what it means for us to come and commute communal together and so specifically even during this time period you know it's like a lot of us have been hurting and continually were and are still currently and felt that it was probably the most pressing thing was that we needed to see some sort of care, right? So I felt like, or we all felt that food providing some sort of a meal along with that discussion was a kind of beautiful nourishment that we can share together. So this is a, this is a project that's going to continue. I mean, it's like, if you're a Miami artist, if you're interested in ideas of collectivizing, um, feel free to reach out to us. 
where this conversation is is still happening today um, and still developing in its process. Amazing. And I see uh, now I see the next slide. Is this part of, of notes that were taken down during this conversation and just connecting the dots or? Yeah, so for each dinner, we invited um, everyone to kind of participate in this brain mapping, if you will. Um, and that you can not only add to it and reimagining what this better like Miami artist community can look like, but also restructure it, right? So a lot of what we're talking about is structural issues. And so what it means for us to figure out like that balance collectively. So the web would constantly change per dinner and per group of people that came in through the space. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you so much. Um, let me just, I'm going through the, the chat here just to see if I missed, um, might have answered some of these already. Uh, let me go through the questions. And just a reminder for everyone, if anyone has any questions, this is the time, so send them over. Let me see here uh, from George Fishman. What are some of the challenges that have tested your resolve and shared individual focus? <laughs> Wait, ask it again? Ask, yeah, it's like storming over here. So. Yeah. <laughs> what are some of the challenges that have tested uh, your resolve and shared, uh, uh, oh, okay. I have tested your resolve and shared slash individual focus. So yeah, what has tested, um, the, some of the challenges that you've shared, I think, in the in individual focus. <laughs> I don't know if I have that right. You can go for that one. I mean, I feel like, um, that question shifts depending on what you're focused on. And I think we very quickly, I mean, I guess I'll speak for myself, very quickly was like, I'm going to be focused on how I can be happy, yeah. um, how I can find joy every day. It's necessary for my existence. And so it's really hard to knock me off that path. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there are challenges, but I don't think that your focus can for me, my focus can't shift from that because I need to be happy in order to survive. Um, and that's that's what matters. Yeah. I don't know. Is that a like fluff answer? No, I think. All right, George. <laughs> I think uh, during this time, you know, it's been, uh, I think it's been very interesting because we're all going through this moment, I think, together, right? Like, for example, we have hurricanes here and when we have a, a horrible hurricane or someone else in another country has a horrible earthquake, we, you know, each community or place goes through this trauma separately. I might know, you know, of all the, the fires that are happening and that touches me, but I feel like with, within this time now, like the pandemic where everyone is hurting, everyone is feeling uh, collectively. I think I see a lot of that, you know, it's not a fluff answer. I see a lot of people going back to this, um, you know, human within us and really questioning like what, what matters, what matters in life now. And it's been I don't want to say great to see, you know, everyone thinking that way because, you know, unfortunately it's not a good thing that brought us to this, this way of thinking, but it's been very interesting, I think, to, to share this intimate um, and this, the fears and, and worries together, you know, I don't know, will it bring more sympathy towards one another? You know, uh, it's, it's not yeah. a, answer at all yeah i mean i think also too in terms of thinking about even this last episode that we were focusing on this idea of time and practice but just referring to time like i think more than anything it's allowed us to slow down if, if anything has forced us to slow down in a lot of ways and i think that's actually the most important thing right now is to be okay with that be okay with that process and to reflect inwardly, you know, and to help where you can is really important. 
Um, one more question. How can we see the entire space? Is there a plan for where you'll take it and how it'll be activated once more? Well, I think you kind of answered that a little bit, but um, if you have anything more to add. I mean, I think our, we've set a goal of um, hitting the road on a long haul trip by mid-October. Who knows if we'll make that goal? <laughs> um, but yeah, we would love to just like pull up at people's houses and see uh, and see what's going on. Like it's there's when you're on wheels, you don't have to have a set destination, and we're looking forward to that and inviting more people into our home. Um, we've had we've started to to have people over for dinner um, just to see what that feels like to have more folks here, and um, we want to extend that invitation to more people. Sorry if it's super loud, but I mean, we're in Miami and it's raining and we live in a truck. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's fine. <laughs> given uh, another question, given everything that has happened, you know, the pandemic, um, Black Lives Matter protests, how do you see uh, community based work as a part of uh, our collective healing? Given everything that's happened in the pandemic, like I was talking about, how do you see community-based work as a part of our collective healing? Um, I mean, it's huge, right? Like, I think that's, it's probably like the thing that's the most centering. Um, and I honor and admire people that are leaders in, in these sort of spaces and that continue each and every day within the struggle, still push forward and persevere and create space for, for all of us. Um, I, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think as, as much as we appreciate this opportunity to connect with everybody through this screen, um, we're looking forward to that physical touch, that actual communion. And um, I haven't really been thinking about ways to shift my practice so much to be able to accommodate this digital space, because yeah. I don't think that anything can really replace that. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I also don't believe that we're going to be in this forever. Right. Well, it kind of answers another question that was here. And the last one, which is maybe more of a, um, I'll talk a little bit about this work. So we have Rosie Gordon Wallace here. Um, she's asking if the, the, the truck, right, this living within the space is, if there's any similarity with Mark Dion's practice and work. We actually have a work in Pam's collection, which is this, this truck that Mark Dion used to um, go into places and document, um, you know, changes within the Everglades. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with this work, uh, but I can actually send it to you later. And, and he does a lot of work based on you know um scientific explorations um but i think with this particular work which i think is what rosie's thinking about it's this truck right that was moving and collecting evidence and and um in the end it was exhibited at the museum and it's still in our it's in our collection and it was exhibited i think when we first opened pam um as this object right so i think maybe to just recontextualize this question is, do you foresee your truck or maybe in this long haul trip that you'll do, do you foresee um, besides the conversation and, and the documentation of your, of your thought process, do you foresee anything uh, else coming out of this journey that you're going to do or will this become a, uh, you know, or transform into this action of the truck moving around and, and living within the space, will it be transformed into something more physical? I mean, yeah, I think there's, there's something in which stuff are hap that's happening organically within the process of us just living here on a day-to-day -day basis and um, new ideas arise for sure. Um, partial, you know, Naja has had this idea since the very beginning of establishing wanting to build this truck of doing this like oral history project, um, which you can talk a little bit more about too. And then like, it's also partially, you know, like a space for supplement projects, so sort of continuation of that. 
aesthetics and mobility has been a part of it. And, and so obviously I think along the lines of our actual journey of moving um, and traveling into different cities or spaces, um, you know, new, new things will definitely come to the surface for sure. And we're just allowing space to be made for that. And I think we're also getting excited about um, collecting works from our friends. You know, behind us, you see like, that's Juan Pablo Garza. Like it, that's also Juan Pablo. That's Mateo. That's Nicole Salcedo. You know, so like thinking about how our space can grow and how we can contribute to our the arts community here um, by sharing the work of our peers. Thank you so much, uh, Javon and Naja. It was a pleasure having you with us and sharing your work, um, this project. Um, thank you so much. It was really fun to, and and also you know allowing this to be the the place to for us to premiere your fourth episode. So we're very. Oh uh, yeah, man, that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you so it. much. Thank you so much. And before we all um, sign off, I just wanted to remind um, about our upcoming uh, live studio. So here we have another slide. Get your uh, pen and paper, uh, your, your cell phones calendar, and make sure to save those in your calendar. And uh, by the end of the year or towards the end of the year, we'll be announcing more talks for next year's, which will have approximately five uh, live studios from January to April. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.